A parasitologist tasked to discover a cure for a global fungal infection outbreak suddenly finds herself trapped inside a metal pod. As she pieces clues together, the people around her ponder the decisions they've made that led them to their imprisonment. Determined, the doctor must find a way out before it's too late. The global outbreak of the untreatable coral fungus has infected 1 in 25 people in Canada. Civil unrest has increased in the past weeks following the scarcity of medical care for most of the country's citizens. Offred Grail, or Fret, a parasitologist, rides a bus to work with her co-workers, all wearing hazmat suits. She fidgets with her gold engagement ring, slowly sliding it off her finger as she watches three civilians get into a fight outside the bus window. In the vase lab, Fred looks through a microscope lens before telling her colleague Ellis that the gold coating they've been testing on the fungus samples has worked and could be the first step in finally developing a cure for the disease. Seconds later, Ellis informs Fred that the government has recently decided to place children in quarantine or the vault. In disbelief, Fred likens the vault to prison and had hoped their research would buy them some time before the government took such drastic measures. Ellis agrees, but unfortunately, the lab no longer has the leverage it once had since her ex-boyfriend left. Outside an observation room, Fred speaks to a jubilant boy named Michael. She asks him how he feels, and Michael says only his fingers hurt and playfully tells her not to touch them. Then, Fred asks where Jenny and Dan are, and Michael says Jenny is asleep but Dan had to go away, confirming Alice's claims earlier. Later, Fred heads to the main vase facility, hoping to speak to her afflicted boyfriend before he goes into a stasis pod, but she's too late. An older man in a wheelchair asks her if she's there to see someone old or sick. When Fred says her ex-boyfriend is sick, the man says she's better off without him because the illness only takes the bad ones, calling it the final judgment. The next day, while wearing a hazmat suit, Fred changes her mind about using an elevator when she sees several people already inside, including a man in a black suit. She heads down the stairs and out through a side exit to get some fresh air. Suddenly, she's struck by a heavy metal object and falls to the ground. Seconds later, she regains consciousness and sees the face shield on her suit broken and bloodied. The assailant then sprays a thick gas directly onto her face, knocking her out. When Fred wakes up, she finds herself inside a metal pod barely large enough to allow movement. Several tubes are attached to her body, including one inserted into her throat. The only light source is the pulsating red glow from the tubes above her. A clear fluid sloshes around at her feet, with large flakes of her skin floating in it. When she pulls the tube out of her mouth, and her mind starts to clear, she looks around the pod and wonders where she is. Fred starts banging on the metal walls of her prison and begs anyone who can hear to let her out. After she calms down, Fred hears her ex-boyfriend John speaking to her. She asks him to help her, but he says he can't do that as he's in the same predicament and injected with antifreeze. Fred says she can't go through the stasis process because she has to finish her research. John asks if she volunteered to go under, but Fred insists she never did, her fuzzy memory telling her that she was jumped and placed inside the pod without her consent. John says the dormancy affects the prefrontal cortex, which might explain her forgetting that she self-committed to the process. She asks how long they've been in there, but he doesn't know either, saying he only woke up when he heard her voice. Fred wonders how to open their pods, and John says the pods are supposed to open on their own upon the person's revival. Suddenly, a metal rod pops out in front of her and scans her face. Then one of the light bars on the wall illuminates a yellow glow. Fred asks John what the yellow light means, but he isn't sure about any of the mechanics in the pod because he worked primarily as a blood engineer for vase. She fumbles around with a large catheter tube attached to her undergarments and pulls it out. Weeks ago, Fred takes samples of the fungus growing on John's hand. He then hands her a tablet and asks her to sign a document, which she refuses. As she walks out of the room, John calls her to come back before angrily throwing the tablet across the room. The document is a dual admission consent form for stasis for both John and Fred. In the present, they hear whistling from outside, and Fred yells for help again. While looking around the pod, she finds a panel and uses the catheter to pry it open. She notices a second yellow bar light up. Fred then pulls out a metal rod from the ceiling and uses it to push out the vent cover. Finally able to see through the small grated window, Fred sees the older man from the vase facility lobby inside his pod across from hers. The man is oddly cheerful and eager to be in his current situation, claiming not everyone is fortunate enough to be born twice. John asks Fred what she can see outside, and she says there are three other pods from her vantage point and notes how the facility looks industrial. A man from another pod wakes up, and they can hear him struggling through his confusion, so Fred guides him through removing the tube from his mouth. John recognizes the man's voice and calls him Wayne, his associate from Vase, and the man from the elevator. Inside her pod, Fred sees a wire on the floor, but when she pulls on it, the third yellow bar lights up. 
When the three men begin discussing who they think will be let out first, Fred reminds them that they are still determining where they are and if there are even people outside to let them out. The old man mentions a woman who was in the pod beside him, who woke up before he did. The woman was taken by what he describes as shining angels. Insensitively, he thinks the woman might have been destroyed by now, as she was covered in the fungal growth. The men argue about how long they've all been in the ponds, estimating years, but Fred thinks they could not have been under for more than a few weeks, or their muscles would have atrophied. Fred pulls a patch electrode from the back of her neck, revealing a thin blue glowing wire. Suddenly, an armored person enters the room, and the old man is excited. Fred looks through the grate and watches as the worker sprays thick smoke, places the old man onto a gurney, and wheels him away. John asks how the older man looks, and Fred says he doesn't look infected. Wayne wonders how long they'll continue to be in the pods, and John calmly tells them to be patient, and trust that whoever's in charge knows what's best for them. A few months ago, Fred takes a sample from Michael's mouth as Darcy, the boy's mother, who also works for Vase, watches from the other side of the glass. Fred heads home and sees a white, slimy fungus growing by a cement wall. When she arrives, John shows her the infection growing on the side of his body. In the present, John mentions Fred was in the vase research team as a parasitologist working on a coral fungicide, which he corrects as a fungistatic. Moments later, Darcy wakes in her pod, and they instruct her on how to remove the intubation tube from her mouth. She asks Fred about Michael, claiming the child had to go under because the treatment wasn't working and they had run out of options. Fred says they must find Michael once they get out of the pods. Suddenly, they hear the sound of a man screaming as though in agonizing pain. In another room, a heavy metal contraption lowers from the ceiling, and a metal arm whirs to the older man's screams. The people in the pods grow concerned, no longer sure they'll be safe when they get carted away. Desperate, Fred throws her body back and forth across the pod to tip it over. When it finally does, it takes her a while to gather herself as she shifts around inside the container. Moments later, she hears a noise outside and watches through the grate. Another armored worker enters the room and opens up another pod. The woman inside falls to the floor, and Fred sees the widespread infection covering her face and body. The moist, white growth glistens and the woman groans in pain, unable to speak. Gret whispers to the woman to open the latch at the bottom of her pod, but the worker drags the woman to a shaft and closes the heavy door. Fred tells the others what she saw and she believed the afflicted woman was disposed of, further worrying them. When a panicked Wayne says he doesn't want to stay there any longer and die from an infection, Darcy says the pathogen's purpose for infection isn't to end its host's life but to change it. She continues that in the later stages of the illness, the fungus feeds off the host's blood until it forms a casing over the body. When the pathogen has taken over completely, the host experiences endless pain and suffering while immobilized and unable to do anything about it. Moments later, Fred kicks on the pod ceiling, hoping it gives away. When John hears the thumping, he says it might not work since the pods were built to endure. He then apologizes for his past mistakes and their relationship, and wishes they could still be together. Fred recalls coming home from work and seeing a wall in their home shaking. When she looks into the bedroom, she catches John in bed with Darcy. John sees her standing in the doorway with guilt in his eyes, but all he gets back is a smirk from Fred. After resting for a few minutes, Fred returns to stomping on the ceiling until it finally falls open. The scientist crawls out of the pod and lets out a victorious scream. As she crawls toward the other pods to open them, one of the armored workers sprays her with gas. Fred grabs the nozzle and pushes it into the worker's suit, taking the person down. Instead of releasing the others, Fred stumbles toward a dark hallway. Later, she finds herself under the same contraption the older man was in. Her face is under a transparent cover, her eyes blinking under the blinding light. In front of a programming screen, Gold finds Fred's engagement ring on the floor in a pool of blood. The worker picks it up and wears it on her pinky finger. Copper arrives and removes his helmet, revealing himself as Ellis under the suit. A metallic mask over his mouth causes him to speak in a soft, robotic voice. Minutes later, Gold and Copper return to the pod room and open another capsule. Inside is a tiny body completely encased in the fungus. Gold picked up the body to take it to the shaft but drops it on the floor, splitting the casing open. Michael whimpers softly on the floor, alerting his mother. Darcy helplessly cries for Michael to do as the workers say. Copper uses a hooked rod to drag Michael into the shaft, where the metal walls flatten his body to destroy it. As Darcy cries out for her child, John lies to appease her and says he saw everything that happened to Michael, and that he looked well and was taken to the next room. Inside Gold's helmet, Fred has a disillusioned look on her face. Months ago, while Fred goes about her job researching how to treat the coral fungus, she sees John flirting with Darcy. 
She then takes a sample of the fungus from work. Later that day, while John is asleep, Fred uses a syringe to inject the fungus into John's member. In the pod room, Wayne asks John what color the lights inside his pod are, theorizing it might indicate something about their deceased status. When John doesn't answer, Wayne and Darcy press him, and he finally admits that he can't see anything. Darcy panics, realizing John had lied about seeing Michael, and now wonders what really happened. Inside his pond, John's infection has spread, covering most of his face and body in this slimy, white fungus. Behind him, the light bars glow blue. John apologizes to Darcy and says he only lied to not upset her. Darcy expresses her regret for placing Fred in the pod, knowing she was the only one who could help Michael get better. There were no more spots in the pods, and John promised her too if she could get Fred down there. Wayne realizes John and Darcy colluded to place Fred in a pod against her will and calls them horrible people. Later, Gold opens John's capsule, and the man tumbles off the platform. He looks at Gold helplessly and touches the gold boot, but his infected hand sizzles on the alloy. John crawls away, calling out Fred's name. As he slowly drags himself down a tunnel, Gold walks towards him menacingly. John begs for his life, saying he started the program and paid for the service, which should count for something. Suddenly, Cobalt, the older man from earlier, plunges a hook onto John's torso and drags him away, the skin on his arm peeling off like a glove as Gold holds onto it. Cobalt then inserts the metal rod into Gold's suit and pins her to the wall. John cries in pain, and his anguish multiplies when Cobalt unintentionally severs his foot while pulling on it. Months ago, Fred places coral fungus samples on metal dishes inside a laboratory hood. When her engagement ring slips off and falls into the sample, she sees the alloy repel the fungus. In the present, Cobalt prepares to place John in the shaft when suddenly, Gold pushes him down into the hole before turning toward John. Moments later, Cobalt catches up to Gold and pushes her aside. The two workers get into a scuffle until Gold is able to hold Cobalt's head in between the closing walls of the machine, ending his life. Gold walks back to John and tosses him the engagement ring. He realizes the worker is Fret, who says the engagement is off. Fret remembers John leaving a bouquet of fake flowers on her table at the lab, with a note saying those flowers won't die, making her smile. Gold takes John to a room and places him on the table. Then, the machine's arm lowers and begins to freeze the growth on John's body. Moments later, the machine welds the armor pieces one by one on the man's body, including the helmet over his face. After the procedure, John, now silver, shuffles laboriously across a yard, his stump bleeding out through the armor. Fred recalls one of their first dates where John tells her about the company he works for, and how they'd love to have a passionate parasitologist like her on the team. The first time they met, John sits next to Fred on the bus, accidentally crushing the flowers on the seat next to her. He's apologetic, so she returns to reading a book on slime. He comments about her reading material, leading to an enthusiastic conversation regarding their shared passion for science. In the present, Wayne finally manages to remove the vent cover. Inside the pod, the infection has started spreading onto his face, and he's resigned to accepting his fate at the hands of the unforgiving fungus. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.